This conference will now be recorded. Right, good evening. Um, yeah, so I was DPE, not for the entire project. Um, I have thanks to my predecessor, guy called Paul Newman, who I've noticed has joined. So hi, Paul. Um, multiple thanks also to Keith Wierski, who was my OLEPE, who gave me an awful lot of support and understanding already. I am obviously a track engineer um, and a DPE. Um, so a fair amount of this is part track, part OLE, part integration stuff. Um, so I, I don't want to at all not not pass up on saying thank you to the people that have helped me with this. But uh, this was a fascinating project to be part of. So allow me to introduce myself. Right. Um, just so you know who I am, um, the obligatory um, quick introduction to me. So I don't actually work on South Wales anymore. I've moved on since this, um, since I was DPE for this one. I now work on the Crossrail P2R and CCMT projects. But I was obviously DPE and track P for South Wales notification before. So yeah. I've been um, I was PE track practice and dive under before that, um, and before that, even before that, I was back on the Scott Wilson Railways. Um, if any of you want to copy the presentation, I will happily give you a copy at the end, and my contact details are down there if any of you fancy giving me a job in the future or anything like that. So, <laughs> moving on. Right, Cardiff Intersection Bridges. Um, this is part two of the presentation. Part one was all about Subtrack, the early Quite the early in, in, intention at this site was to install slab track and do a low, track lowering scheme. A um, whole variety of reasons why that was not feasible, which are covered in my part one. I'm probably conscious that some people that have joined have never seen part one. I will redo part one online at some point. Um, if you haven't seen that, keep your eye out for that. So I won't go into a lot of the reasons why, but it was going to be a slab track, but it's now the electric, electrical clearance is the issue. Um, this is just to give you a feel of where the site is. So Cardiff Central Station is off this side, just a couple of hundred metres. Um, we're literally just coming outside of Cardiff. This is one of the big hotels on the exit to Cardiff. Cardiff Queen Street is again, very short distance, just off the screen up this way. Cardiff Bay is a few hundred metres, probably a little bit more than that, um, down in that direction. And then this is, these four tracks here are the South Wales Main Line through from Cardiff towards London, off in that direction. The other feature you really need to notice on here is this here is the Butte Dock Feeder Canal. So that comes up, goes underneath, underneath the main line, and goes off that way. That was one of the reasons why we ended up on this uh, on this solution. Um, it was very challenging. We had to track lower through that and rebuild the canal. That proved incredibly difficult. Um, this new solution was also incredibly difficult, but overall, this proved to be a better solution. This is the solution that we actually ended up building in the end. So. Just a few photos so you can familiarise yourself with the site, you can get some, some kind of feel of what the site looks like. Um, Cardiff Station is behind me, I'm facing Newport in this. So this is the line that just come up, risen up to my right and is now going over the top to Cardiff. Queen Street is off that way and Cardiff Bay is that second bridge you can see off there, or going off in that direction. This is much the same, just a bit closer so you can get a feel for what the site looks like. This is the view feeder canal, so this little parapet here and this little parapet here shows you where the beauty dock feeder, the canal goes underneath the track. Um, this is another site, just so you can get a view from the other side, I'm now facing Cardiff Central Station. Um, these interesting square things here are ground anchors that we put in as part of the first solution. Uh, but again, if you go back to the first one, I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, general feel for the site facing Cardiff, this is taken from Pellet Street Footbridge, which is a bit further back. Um, so again, you get an idea of the curvature of the tracks going underneath, uh, underneath the bridges and then it goes up on a gradient towards Cardiff Central Station. Now I mentioned the Butte Dock Feeder. Um, it's a culvert, goes underneath the track. A fair number of people when I talk about culverts think a small pipe or a semi large boundary pipe. This was a lot of water. Um, one of the reasons why the initial, the initial challenge became so difficult, the initial challenge of track lowering became so difficult was diversion of this and, and piling works. Um, just to get a feel for the amount of water that did go underneath Cardiff Inception Bridges, this was a feeder canal for Beauty Stock, which fed on a variety of important places and services, including docks and steel works and other, other factors. Um, shutting that down was difficult, but again, it's, that was what was underneath. So, the problem was obviously we're an electrification, electrification project, we need to put wires up somehow through this bridge. Before we started now, including CASA. CASA is Cardiff Area Signalling Renewal. That was a project that came before us. Um, they knew we were coming, they knew we were track lowering, and they set up some of the track to tie in with what would become our future designs, or so they said. So that was the plan at least. Um, but this was, this was the numbers 
before the space underneath the bridge before Casa started doing any of their works. These are quite small numbers in terms of fitting wiring through. That's why we ended up with the trap lowering solution initially. Um, the group three level value, which we worked to to work out what to do, was 4.525. That's what we needed to be able to put some kind of electrification system through. And obviously, we don't have that. Uh, we ended up with a snipe track system, which lowered the track 331 mil at the maximum point. Um, and as I said, the, the intention was to build that, but we moved away from that for a whole variety of reasons. So above it, we've got the two bridges, and below it, we've got the BP the canal just to add some wonderful complexity to the site. This is a view facing Cardiff Central Station. So that, that up there is the start of Cardiff Station. There's a hill that comes down towards the bridges. And then you look at the vertical line, you come back down a beautiful hill, and then you ramp up, and there's this hump over the top here. So remember that canal. That canal runs alongside there. What that hump is, is going over the Butte Dock Feeder Canal. Because at that point, when Cardiff, Cardiff Sydney project put that track in, the intention was that we were going to take this, take, take it over from here, we were going to lower through there, and this was going to become a lovely, beautiful alignment, gently come through here and gently ramp back up again and tie in somewhere near where I'm standing. Obviously, that never happened. So we're now left with an interesting vertical alignment that I had to get handed back to the maintainer and some of the people that helped me do that are on this call and smiling, smiling or cursing me as, a, as it may be. So after CAS are finished, they left us with a minimum Right, a minimum clearance. Now this is the single point, the single worst point under the whole bridge of 4.373 millimetres. Normal uplift requirements for the Series 1 standard. Series 1 is the standard that says for an electrification system, you need a certain amount of clearance, a certain amount of allowances, a certain amount of tolerances, all of these numbers you build in. So Series 1 says you need to allow 200 millimetres for uplift, um, that's how it, how it's predicted, an 80 mil predicted, double per that standard, which I'm sure my early colleague can explain in much more detail than I ever could, um, plus an allowance for wind. There was a great debate over what the uplift number should be, because various tests done at Old Dolby showed the number to be closer to 38 millimetres, um, but obviously that's just in tests, that's not a standard, so if we're going to go with a normal electrification system, we need to allow 200 mil uplift. The standards also require a construction tolerance of plus or minus 10 millimetres, a construction depth, so that's the physical bridge arms, that's the arms that hold the, hold the contact wire and are attached to the bridge to hold it in place, requires 120 millimetres. Uh, sag in span, so obviously the contact wire is held between those, it's not held continuously, and therefore the contact wire, no matter what you do to it, is going to sag a little, a little bit, so you've got to allow for that sag. That's 15 millimetres under the bridge. And of course, you need to fit a train through there. So the kinematic, so that's the, the one that moves around, um, vehicle gauge, the, shape, the maximum size and shape of a train, any, any train, this is a theoretical gauge a train could be inside of, is 3990 millimetres. Simple bit of maths, we take the 4373, we subtract all of that, and we end up with a value of 28 millimetres. So in initial thoughts, of course, well, there's still space. You could fit all the way requirements in. That is your physical requirements. And then of course you move on to electrical requirements. This is a 25 kilo, 25,000 volt wire we're putting through. You can't just put things too close to each other because electricity doesn't work very well. So minimum contact wire height in RT1210. That's essentially the Bible for overhead line engineers, which again, I must thank my overhead line colleagues for helping me to understand over a period of many years. Um, that states not less than 4165 for the minimum contact wire height. Maybe feasible, maybe not. Subject of a lot of work to work out whether we could achieve that. But the next one says you need a minimum required clearance from a live conductor to an earth. Functional insulation is basically the minimum that you the minimum normal amount amount under the standard. So it's the uh, not a derogation territory, but that's if you put 270, you're okay, but you're at the very end of what the standard will allow you to do. That 270, don't forget applies up and down. So that is 270 millimetre requirement from the live contact wire to a train, because that train, in a purely electrical diagram circuit, in a sense, a train is essentially a conductor, it's a piece of metal. Ditto the bridge. The bridge is also electrically, it's just a piece of metal. So you also need that 270 millimetres above the system from the top of any live component up to the bridge deck, which of course is made of metal. 270 twice from those 28 millimetres, obviously that doesn't work. 
we're going to allow SSB derivation territory and we need to do something a bit more innovative. Now, one of the first things you do when you say, right, well, I need to essentially break a standard, I need to derogate from a standard, I need to not follow the standards, is to try and understand why the standard requires what it does. Looking into that, then you say, what is the 270 actually about? Is that if you go less than 270, you're going to get arcing on a regular basis? Is that fault conditions? Is that specific conditions? And so we started learning what is 270 all about? One of the reasons for it is a surge voltage. So something like a lightning strike, lightning, if the lightning hits the wire or the contact system somewhere nearby, some or all of that charge will flow through the electrical, through the electrical wire, could end up going along those wires looking for someone to discharge, and it finds a bridge deck fairly close to it, and it will arc up to the bridge deck because that's, that's a nice earth, that's a convenient place, place for it to go. Also things like fault currents, so various things to do with the um, switching system, the power supply system, trains themselves occasionally generate faults, things go wrong in systems, um, and occasionally they will generate untoward currents and various faults. Doesn't happen very often, but that's one of the reasons why that number is there. Uh, arcing prevention, so once an arc forms, quite often arc will stay there, so we don't want the arc to form in the, form in the first place, so if we can discourage that arc from forming, that number is partly aimed at preventing that, and also safety of trends and staff, so if there is a big bang, um, and there's people standing quite close by, potentially they might get hurt, not necessarily electrocuted, but obviously that's a very bright light, very lo lots of noise, scares people if nothing else, and in, a worse, in, in some very specific conditions, yes, they could receive an electric shock somehow. So, you look at those and say, well, that's the point of the standard. Does it apply in this, or can I do something to make that not apply? And that's the whole point of this entire design, and that's where we went down. We started looking at the standard, looking at the numbers, looking at everything we could possibly do to reduce the numbers that we required there. And so, obviously, it's all about applying mitigation. So the first question to ask, of course, is why didn't you do something else? Before you go down this road with all this disruptive, all this additional work, what you need to do is look at other options. Can you I really build the bridge? We could have done, um, back to my part one presentation, there's a whole host of reasons. It was very, very expensive. Um, can't really share the cost with you, but it was, suffice to say, sort of sharp intake of breath kind of numbers um, and unacceptably disruptive. It was going to disrupt services an awful lot. So the second option was obviously the slab track. Um, we did design a lowering scheme. It was slab, going to be slab track. Um, the culvert reconstruction that allowed us to do the lowering, uh, place the feed in a siphon, that became extremely difficult for a whole variety of reasons. That ended up costing a lot of time, a lot of money. The ground conditions were incredibly difficult. Um, and we, we started working on this as a second option in case the first option essentially became unbuildable, which it essentially did, and this one became feasible. So we, we stopped the piling and slab track eventually and moved on to this. We also looked at having an earth section under the bridge because just for that little bit, we could maybe uh, maybe, maybe earth it out. Transport from Wales on where is looking at earth sections or neutral sections um, under some of their bridges, and in some areas it does work. But on this one, if you remember, you go through the bridge on the approach to Cardiff, you instantly start climbing up hill, and there's a set of signals really not far away. The trains coming under here are quite often going quite slowly. They're going to end up very. They're going to end up um, stopping at those signals, and if the train pantograph lines up with the bridge badly, then we could end up with a pantograph in the neutral section. We can't allow it to happen because we can't essentially have broken down trains on a regular basis on the approach to Cardiff. So it requires something called double blocking. So you make you make the train wait another signal section further out to make sure it doesn't happen. That becomes restrictive operationally. That starts creating queues of trains. Essentially, it just no, we couldn't do that. It was operationally not feasible. So in a nutshell, we came up with a system. The track, we shrunk the track down, we put shallow ballast in, I used timbers which are a bit shallower, we used glandy rails to improve the track stiffness to have a mitigation for the timbers and the shallow ballast. The bridge, we put an insulated coating on the underside, so that massively cuts down the back 270 because there's no longer a path to earth. The bridge itself, we've stopped it being a metal conductor, we put an insulated coating on the underside and therefore electricity can't arc up to the bridge. And the early system itself, we squeeze the tolerances down in every single place we could possibly do. Um, we put a contact wire cover on top of it to prevent bird, to prevent bird sitting on there and to help with the, um, the, the clearance of the bridge as well. Uh, very reduced clearances, for which we had a whole safety case and did a lot of extra work. And also we put a surge arrestors on, which I'll come onto later on that we did. Simple, very simple. Okay, 
We've got ourselves a design, we've got a, set, a working set of requirements, let's do it. We have to replace the track system to put the landing rails and the timbers in. And that was the picture that presented us, out, presented us when we excavated the track. That is the culvert. So this is on top of the Butte Feeder Canal. Um, you can see the existing track. This is track we haven't touched yet. That was the existing ballast depth. It was already not an awful lot. Um, we're going to make it slightly worse when we put the track back afterwards. But that's the surface that we were presented with. So track engineers among you, um, if anyone wants to have a go, and Antonio, I know you know the answer to this because I explained this to you and you're not allowed to answer. Um, track engineers among you, does that look familiar, that pattern? Is there anything there that you think, I know what that looks like? If anyone, if anyone recognizes that, unmute yourself briefly and uh, let me know if you've got the idea. I can't do the chat at the moment, so. Anyone, anyone got any ideas what that is? Dual block sleepers. No, it's not. No, it's something a bit more basic and everyday everyday track maintenance. Tamping, tamping times. Tamping, yes, they are tamping times. So this this here is the concrete top of the culvert itself. These are the con precast concrete units, and then next to it, all of this is a thick bitumen layer on top that was the original waterproofing when the culvert was built, which obviously is no longer in fantastic condition. So these. Are tamping times where tampers have run through there, not realised quite how shallow the ballast is, presumably on, on normal setting or not sufficiently restricted setting, and have whacked this ballast and that's, been, that's broken down over time. So obviously one of our first challenges is we have to replace, we have to repair that uh, before we can build back on top of it. So we did, uh, we infilled all of the bitumen layer, um, we created a nice flat surface layer, we didn't infill it with bitumen again, I think we infilled it with reasonably standard concrete, um, on top of that, we poured a new waterproofing waterproofing layer. Can't for the life of me remember what the product was, but it was a, a Sybil's product that did waterproofing. We poured that on top, we sealed the top of that deck, and then we let that dry, and then we built our new trap system on top of that. So, the track form. Timber sleepers were sent in a 56 rail. So, this is track engineer, just going to show you what we did. We put landing rails on there, that was for CRT mitigation. And also that was for alignment management. So a timber sleeper, particularly a timber sleeper on a very shallow ballast, is not as strong as a concrete sleeper. A concrete sleeper is heavier, it holds the rails in place a bit more and has better lateral resistance. We've got shallow, shallow depth ballast, we've got about 80 millimetres at the minimum worst point, and went up slightly in a few other, other places, but 80 was, 80 was the worst case value. That's not a lot of ballast. Ballast is between 20 and 50 mils, so sort of 50 to 40 mostly. That's literally two, two and a half pieces of stone underneath your sleeper. Um, not a fat lot of stone when you're doing, dealing with short stuff. So the, the ability of that stone to resist lateral movement, resist general track movement, is much, much reduced. Uh, on top of the waterproofing layer, we also put a PW9, that's a really thick, robust textile. So that gave the waterproofing layer and the repaired culvert surface an additional layer of protection. Uh, and then we've got a geogrid over the, toll, over the whole lot to even out the settlement between the culvert, which obviously is not going to move, and the um, geotextiles and the ether. We saw that set for clay out either side of it. That just allow, again, just try to reduce the settlement, try to improve, increase the track stiffness and manage it over the interfaces. So the whole, whole depth there was 415 mil. A standard track form depth, that's 300 mil ballast, plus an extra 50 mil because you're over structure, plus a standard EG49, which is a shallow but concrete sleeper, would have resulted in a track depth of 680. We're now down to 415. So we're starting to buy millimetres. And a lot of the work that we did here was literally buying millimetres everywhere we could find them. That was, that was how we shrunk the track down. As we designed our track, we were faced with other challenges as well. Because this is a very, very reduced clearance system, this here is the only bridge arm. So this is the bridge surface. On top of that, to hold the wires in place, we have a metal bracket that attaches to the bridge arm, that's the bridge arm, and that's there would be the contact one. That is essentially a metal pipe sticking down, and from a train's perspective, it's, an, it's a thing that it needs to stay the minimum distance away from. We realised that it was not possible to be fully compliant through this bridge. We had a choice of either we can provide W12 gauge, it's not W12 today, but we did have a requirement in the standard to provide for W12 in the future, and we know that at some point, who knows when, but at some point W12 is likely to be wanted on this route. So we 
as a project, if we built something that we knew didn't provide double in 12, and then someone else has to come along in one, two, five, ten years, whatever it may be, and then have to do retrospective work on our site to provide double 12, we're, it's just a waste of money. So we had to provide double 12 if at all possible. The flip side was window boxes. Window boxes is a gauge clearance where someone's sticking their head out of a window. You need to have, allow an empty space between any fixed anything, in this case, the bridge column of the, of the bridges above, and the train. That's a 450 millimeter gap from the edge of the train up to the fixed anything. That's to allow anyone that is sticking their head out the window to have a look at what's going on, to avoid them hitting um, that structure and being harmed or killed. There have been a few instances, obviously, where that has happened. Infrastructure has got a lot closer than that 450. Um, during the project, we had one incident of that near Bath, and that, that increased the focus even more. Um, and so we, we had a difficult choice to make because we couldn't provide both. We couldn't do W12, which was a clearance from here to that bridge, that bridge arm, and also the window boxes. There simply wasn't enough space. Interesting choices because, of course, trains are evolving over time, and the newer trains don't have openable windows. So it's only the older trains that that's, that window box issue is still a problem. So do we compromise the window box clearance and say, actually, I'm going to put a small infringement that's only valid for some trains, and as time goes by, the number of trains that applies to will drop further and further, and one day will go to zero, and all the future trains, which are trying to get bigger, are now allowed to. Or do we say, well, actually, W12 is not required today, it's required at some point in the future, and actually it's not that hard to move the track around to provide it. But actually what is there today is openable windows, and therefore that's an issue. So we had a, had a debate over what to do. Um, we went to RSSB, we went round and round in circles, as we quite often do in these things, um, and eventually we were told that this is not classified as new infrastructure, um, and therefore the requirement to provide the 450 did not necessarily apply, um, and we withdrew our application. You can debate whether that's the right decision or not. Um, there was an awful lot of debate amongst all the different people involved whether that was the right decision or not, but that is the decision that we eventually ended up with, and that came from someone, someone very senior within Network Rail. So, interesting outcome for that. Track four, moving on then. Um, various timbers, just to, this, I think it was Paul Newman, my predecessor, they said this is a project that keeps on giving. Um, and it really was. Every time we thought we'd done something, something new popped up. So after we got the track, got the track in, we got the landing rails in, we got most of it finished, we started noticing quite a lot of splits had occur occurring in the timbers. So you see a nice, nice split along here, you see a lovely split all the way along here, all the way along here. Um, again, that opened up a debate, why was it splitting? Were they partially split? Are they faulty on supply? Was the installation contractor entirely to blame? Was there a bit of both? Um, difficult discussions, trying to understand that. Then we started looking at, well, what exactly is non-compliant? It's a lump of wood. It's gonna split sometimes. Actually, that's just how wood works. So what is non-compliant? So I went up to the standard manager and got some not quite as clear as I wanted to responses. Um, and we established that actually, yes, they are gonna split, but we have an issue with our supply chain at the moment, that timbers are being supplied with splits in and any drilling just makes it worse. So actually we could replace the whole lot and we probably still have a whole load of new splits, which was a lovely, interesting conversation with the maintainer. Hello, Mr. Track Maintainer, I want to hand this back for the splits. Well, it's not compliant. Yeah, I know, but I can't do anything about it. Here is yours. It became a difficult issue. So we ended up buying a truck over spares and said, actually, we're just gonna buy new ones. We'll get them delivered to your maintenance yard and then over one, two, five, 10, 20, whatever it happens to be years, as they become unserviceable, you've got the stairs in your yard and you can install them yourself. And that, that was the, the agreed way forward. So we managed to solve the problem by having a sort of interim solution rather than ripping them all out and starting again and tying ourselves up in knots. It was also shallow ballast, of course. So we installed, shallow, we installed these signs, caution very shallow ballast. Now note that does not say do not tamp. Per the standard, that is untampable track. There's 80 millimetres of ballast underneath that sleeper. You can't tamp that for the standard. It says the minimum required for me mechanised tamping, tamping is, and that number's just gone out of my brain because I'm on a presentation, of course, but it's a lot more than 80. Um, but essentially very shallow ballast. Now, Carillion came and said, actually, we can tamp it. We can't tamp it using the normal settings, and we can't tamp it using the normal, necessarily, machinery. But some of our equipment does have much more ability to be customised. We have someone in our organisation that knows tampers upside down and inside out. 
And actually, we can tank that. It's not going to be anywhere near as effective, but it's still better than a team of men who can get, who can get hammers. So we let them do it. I was on site for it myself. I was actually very sceptical and I was very sceptical about it. And I was standing next to the tamper, listening, waiting to hear the drum of the tamping times on the coal underneath and feel the whole track vibrating. But it didn't, and it worked. So part of that system was actually, it was a lesson for me also as well, that no matter how sceptical I am, future equipment gets better, things change, putting a restriction that says do not tank may be valid at the time, may be valid with the equipment I've got at the time, but actually doesn't necessarily mean that it will always be valid, and actually doesn't necessarily mean that I've got all the information. I, I found out through that that reading the standard, yes, I should have put a sign that says do not tamp. But actually talking to people that knew an awful lot more about tamping than I ever ever will, then actually that's different. So part of the conversation, and it's a lesson in general engineering terms, don't put a do not, put the reason why or not, and then people in the future can work it out for themselves. That was an interesting little thing for assignment. Track form. So timber sleepers uh, carry an eight degree penalty for critical rail temperature. For those that don't know, critical rail temperature is a temperature when the rails get up to a temperature in the height of summer with the sun bearing down on them, there comes a point where you have to start thinking about putting speed restrictions on, putting watchmen out, um, in really severe cases, even closing the line if you can't get the watchman out on track. Um, they, there are obviously there's formulas that you work out for various track forms, the various type of track. Because it's timber sleepers, the point which those mitigations go into place is eight degrees lower than it would be for a concrete sleeper. So we've just built a piece of track just on the outskirts of Cardiff Central Station that's going to have requirements for what uh, CRT watchmen and potentially restrictions on speed and or track closures if you can't get there because it's red zone banned um, with eight degrees less than the surrounding area. Not good. So part of the derogation request that I put in, I thought, well, that's just timber sleepers. There is nothing in there about the effect of landing wells. So I work with the maintainer. I work with Andy Franklin, who's on this call, obviously. Um, and we worked out that actually the landing rails will help. Landing rails will improve the stability of the track, and actually at the end, just to avoid having a weak spot here, these are lateral resistance plates, which are basically massive plates with um, yeah, massive steel plates that stick down into the ballast to add extra lateral restraint. So with those, I stopped anything happening at the end. With, gland with landing rails, I stopped, I uh, reduced the likelihood of the buckle forming there. And therefore, I got a delegation in place to reduce that to four, which just made the maintainer's life a bit easier and made the operator's life a bit easier, easier as well. And hopefully, we will not end up with a situation where we have to close the track. That's what it looked like in a bit more. There was, of course, AWS magnets because signals are not far away. So just to be awkward and just to get in the way, that had to be in the middle. We had to stop our landing rails, flip them to the outside for a short while, flip them back in and carry on in the middle. That's what it looks like. When we finished um, the CASA alignment. What we wanted to do, sorry, I'll be right. when, we, when we started this project, we're saying, uh, what we wanted to do was take the track as it was after Carillion had finished their initial works um, and say, well, actually, can we just come up with a design that fits the track that's there already? If I can create a form A that measures what was there already, it was put back in a bit of a hurry um, because the project was cancelled, track was infield and, and made, made good at a reasonably short notice and it wasn't really into any particular design it was more into well that's kind of what it was there before trying to close out the project of course we had a track design it was a track lower design the slab track but that was no longer happening so suddenly i found myself with a track that had been built without a design and without any method of handing it back so we got wsp to create a design and say if at all possible create me a form a that matches more or less what was there already. That way I can deem it to have been installed, so hence the retrospective within installation tolerances. If I can deem it to have already been installed, I can go straight from detailed design to as built, say job done, here's your lift and slow to go, lift and slow to, no, lift and slow to go tables, which are a small number of millimetres, job slow, there we go, hand it back. For lines, C, lines D and E, that was possible. So we ended up doing exactly that, form A, form B, straight to as built without ever, do, ever doing any track works because it worked. For lines B and C, that was not possible. This was the vertical alignment that WSP produced and said, just to demonstrate, that this was never intended to be installed. This isn't a dig at WSP in the slightest. This is their demonstration of, no, it just doesn't work. Sorry, mate. It, no, you're into physical works. So that, of course, we took to the round and went, Sorry, no, took that to the project managers and went, mm, sorry, actually, we, need to, we now need to start 
talking about actual physical track works, we need to find a bit more money, we need to put actual physical works into the plan and start working out how to do it. And of course, as soon as we're into tamping, the track's going to go upwards, and we're already into a project where every single millimetre counts. So again, that fed back into the tables that we were working with the overhead line people, and that started feeding into another design iteration of how to manage it all going, to, going forward. Then we had to look at the bridge. The condition of the bridge itself was not fantastic. Um, it was quite an old bridge. It's built in 1943. Um, obviously, this is now a few. Uh, it is been there. Uh, I can't remember how many years that is, but it's not in the uh, not in the greatest of condition. This is the top of column six, which is one of the biggest, strongest columns on there. And you can see it's eating away at some of the metal there. Um, this is the underside of the other bridge. Again, not great condition. So we needed to do some repairs. We needed to work out what was going on. This is the top of one of these troughs at the top. So this is a this is a trough deck bridge. This is the top of one of those troughs. You can see the that was once a nice, perfectly straight flange. Obviously, it's not quite anymore. Um, so various rusts coming out at the end. It was not in a fantastic condition. Now, it wasn't about to fall down or anything, but it wasn't great and it needed some work before we started spraying insulated coating on it, covered everything up. That was a piece that randomly fell off during the works while they were tidying it up and cleaning it. Um, so, just for scale and for interest, I managed to get a picture of that from the um, civil contractor who were doing that just to show you. That's kind of the metal that was falling off it, and that's highlights the scale of the problem that we had to face. So we repaired the bridge. Um, we put very strengthening bits on. This you can see here, there is a new metal bracket that we have attached on the underside of the flange. There's loads of new bolts going through the middle of it, and that just increases the strength of this flange. That's it's not the only one we did. We did quite a few of these on, across the bridges wherever it was very weak. We had an awful lot of extra metal work going up there, an awful lot of improvement works. We had to do that before, of course, we put the coating on that part of the bridge. Because once we spray that coating on, you can't see the bridge anymore and you can't check what's condition is anywhere from here as well. So that brings us on to the insulated coating. The method of application um, to take you through how we put the coating on was to clean the existing metal, which got I've gone through, which of course meant various bits fell off and we had to repair it to be able to do that. We used a vapor blast, not a grip blast. We then dried it uh, with gas torch, we applied a primer, applied GLS coating, and then we tested the spark directly. It's much better. To show you that with photos, that is a picture of the insulated coating being sprayed on. It's a standard spray gun. Sorry, that's not insulated coating at all. That's a picture of the vapor blasting happening, first of all. Let me get my, get my project right. Um, that's vapor blasting, so that's cleaning the bridge off, getting any loose bits off, getting any dirt off, making sure it's as good as you can get it. Once we've done that, we dry it. That's a gas torch. It's nice, nice, but it's literally a, a big, thick gas burner. You just apply the flame onto the bridge dries it all out, gets rid of any last little bits of dirt, last little bits of dirt and debris, and dries the bridge off ready to have a primer applied. That's the primer, manually applied, just a paintbrush. Um, that's, that's dropped on first. And then that's the point where we start spraying the actual insulated coating on. Picture the, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey. <Right>. <laughs> I had a video link there, and it worked when I first tested this video. Um, let, me, <laughs> let me just nip to the separate project. Let's play it separately. Um, there we go. Yes, like this. There we go. Can you see that video? Is that playing on the shared screen? Someone just confirmed. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, we got that. Yeah. Lovely. So that's that's the GLS coating actually being applied. Um, it's a simple spray. You can see the nozzle goes over his shoulder around there, and then this nozzle goes off the ground level. Um, just standing up on a scaffold, a few clicks, that is dry within literally a couple of seconds. So applied in small sections, small sprays, um, once, it's, once it's applied, once it's dried, what they will then do is check, see whether that is enough. I'm going to fast forward the video to the next interesting bit, which comes just about there. Now watch this other guy, he's getting ready. He's, he's, put more, he's put a lot more insulated coating on, and once it's got, I think it's two or three coating, he's putting a measuring gauge on. That is a gauge that basically tests how far away the metal is and therefore how thick the insulated coating is. The standard requires an absolute minimum thickness of four millimetres. So, of course, we specified five millimetres just to make sure that we got a uniform covering of at least four everywhere and a bit of spare to make sure it was adequate. So that's, that's, that's the insulated coating being applied. Um, there we go. That's a close-up picture of that gauge that you just saw him applying. So. At the point that picture was taken, that's 3.78 millimeters thick. So obviously that gauge is showing there's still another layer of spray coating being required. And they, they did that in 
or, yeah, or, or large number of faces across the bridge. And then once you're on that, is this not going to work? No, it's not. Well, let's play the other video, which has decided not to work. Um, no, come on. No, no. Yeah, actually, honestly, right. So what you can see here is that's come up on that. Sorry, that's that's come up okay. Yeah, the video. Fab, thank you. Right, so what you can see here is they're doing some spark testing. So watch closely. You can see occasionally some sparks flying off that. What they're doing, that you see, there's an electric charge. That's, that's connected to an electric generator. They move that along the spray coating once they've finished applying it. And in any tiny little gap where it's not enough, you've got any tiny little pinprick holes anywhere the spray didn't quite apply, you get a spark. Because, of course, that's trying to discharge to the metal bridge deck on the other side of the coating. Anywhere they get a spark, they're then applying a manual extra bit of coating and making sure that the spray is complete, thick, thick enough, and there is absolutely nowhere. So you even pinprick tiny little bits, you made absolutely certain that it were absolutely certain that the coating was applied and was completely covering the bridge to the required level. Um, I can spot a question already: How does that gauge work for the coating? I can answer that on straight away. Haven't a clue. Apologies, no idea. They had a gauge; it worked. <laughs> Apologies to Ryan in your, in your questions. I can't. I can't answer that one. I'm afraid. But uh, right, that's the picture of the insulated coating when it was applied. Um, that's the that's the finished product in a certain area. Obviously, it's applied in certain areas, and you can stop. We did this over a lot of weekends. Um, some parts of the bridge would get done, other parts had to wait for the steel repairs to happen, for extra blasting to happen. Um, so we had quite a lot of areas where it stopped and then restarted and stopped and restarted. But over many, many weekends, we eventually got the whole bridge covered. And that's, that's a close-up of what the bridge, what the coating looks like overall. So this is the, the bolts between the arches, of course. We sprayed the whole lot on, and you do get a nice, lovely uniform coating, mostly. Also, of course, being a semi-liquid coating, it does sometimes tend to drip. So on some of these bubbles, particularly at the ends, this was one of the flat flanges, we had a little drips coming off. Um, they're not a major problem. They needed tidying up a little bit, and there was, yeah, the um, contracts did go along and tidied them up a little bit. It doesn't look great, but it's still an insulated coating, and it was still fit for purpose. But it was something we need to keep a close eye on. So, talking of the insulated coating then, does the coating have product acceptance? was the first question of anyone when we said, oh, we've got this great insulated coating. Does it have product acceptance? No. Does it need product acceptance was the follow-up question, to which opened up, of course, the usual huge debate. Um, yes, it sort of does. No, it sort of doesn't. Maybe it does. It's a specialist product that's being used for a specialist location. It should become a lot wider product. We went around in a whole variety of circles about product acceptance, but the ultimate thing was it didn't have product acceptance. Um, it was being installed with agreement of the maintainer, with agreement of the STE people, with agreement of the companies installed. Um, the company that supply it, a company called GLS, essentially didn't have the resources or the money to take you through the product acceptance process. So we had to take a decision. This is not really a product accepted product. It probably will become one at some point, but at the time of putting it on this bridge, it was not. Um, and that's, that, that's still a discussion in progress in various ways. Was it suitable as a metal protective coating was the next question. From the structure maintainer's perspective, once we spray this coating on, he can't see his bridge anymore. If there's a crack forming, if there's rust forming underneath that coating, how do you maintain it? How do you see it? How do you how do you check what condition that bridge is in? And does the coating act as the, act in the same capacity as the paint system and the metal protective coating that some standard products that would be used by Network Rail for a standard bridge repair provide? Yes, sort of, maybe. Um, again, we started doing comparisons to other paint systems. Um, Again, we did a fair amount of work on trying to establish what exactly is in this stuff and what exactly is it is it doing. And we said, try and give us a full list of ingredients, and they we're not too happy to do that uh, because obviously it's a bespoke product of theirs. Um, but eventually, we got to a stage where actually we did demonstrate that it was equivalent to a paint system. It was suitable as a metal protective coating. The paperwork to demonstrate that was not as wonderful as it should have been probably, but and therefore it took a while to go through the negotiations, but we did get there in the end. Does it cover the whole bridge? No, in simple, um, in simple terms, this is expensive stuff. Um, it would have been wonderful to cover the entire bridge and just have one nice uniform coating on the whole bridge in some ways, but in other ways, that would have been very expensive, it would have taken even longer. Um, 
So actually we ended up with a, I think it was two meter wide strip. I'm probably, probably got that number wrong from memory, but it was a strip that went above the contact wire and a set distance either side of it to allow for future stagger cha future changes, future stagger, etc. Um, so no, it was dis discrete strips across the bridge, which you can see in some of my photos. Um, and did it interface with the existing protection? Of course, the existing me yeah, metal protective coating and paint systems, we had a feathering detail where we didn't just literally stop the coating there and, and start the bridge coating in another place. We did have a, a feathering in detail where we mixed the two together. It wasn't perfect because the existing paint system was old and was not perfect. Um, but again, we, we did work the details and we did come up with the best solution that we possibly could. The next up, of course, is water. Um, this is a trough deck bridge. Uh, both, both bridges are troughs. One is a rectangular trough, one is more curved trough, but they are both trough decks. On top of that is the Cardiff, uh, Cardiff Queen Street and various tracks heading south towards Cardiff Bay or Cardiff Central. There's a lot of water up there, we found. The end of these bridge decks, you can see on this, you can see water is pouring down. Now, this is the best photo I could get at whatever this was, three in the morning or something on a very wet, horrible, rainy night. Um, but you can see the water is literally pouring out down the bridge. And I st stood there looking at this water pouring down, thinking this, if that water pours onto an overhead line wire when we put it up there, we're not in a good place. What that is, these are weak holes. So this is the end of the bridge trough. As these fill with water from the tracks above, water of course run down to the end and comes out of that weak hole. And detail on the circular trough section, you can just see weak holes there and there. So that's water on the, on the surface on the top and it will pour out underneath. There's a lot of water we found mig migrates down to that bridge. Now water, in a general sense, now, yeah, I know these systems get rained on all the time. It's fine, it doesn't have any effect. Water dripping from a structure or a thing above it, no problem, doesn't matter in the slightest. Running water, that's very different. Having a running stream of water from the inside of a metal deck running down and for our argument's sake, say the contact wire was somewhere there. If that fell on a live component, that is now a path to Earth. Doesn't matter how far away that electric component is, the electricity will probably travel up that water, find the metal in the bridge, and arc out. And so you now have a path to Earth, you now have a cause for arcing. So that created yet another problem for this bridge. We needed to do something with those weak holes. We needed to close them or divert the water flow or somehow mitigate those. So what we came up with was a series of water troughs. This coloured strip here is the width of the insulated coating. This is your track centre line. And so what we did, we took a little, little plastic trough and we installed it to catch the water coming out of the weak holes that is anywhere above the wire and a set distance either side. And then it goes sideways out. You can see there's literally a hole on the end and it just drops down out, of, out into the track. Didn't go into any active drainage system. It replicated what was there. It was just moving where the water was going. So we didn't affect how much water was ending up on the track. We didn't really affect the local flows. So we didn't need any active system to match this. It was all, all a simple case of put that in. That's a close up look. You can see there's a plastic bracket. It's all, it's all GRP. Uh, it's all the epic plastic stuff, they're all non conductive materials, including the bolts, including the washes, everything, uh, because obviously this is going in very close proximity to the overhead wire underneath. Catches that, drives it along, drops the water out to the end. And that's the anchor detail, just to show you. So that's the, plastic, that's the detail for the plastic, um, plastic support. Uh, you can see the one there, but obviously, with the trough in there. So, I've got a better this is the only picture I've got of the trough without the uh, without the support without the trough in, installed it. So, sorry for the poor quality there. The idea was that the majority of that concrete trough, so a metal trough, is going to be filled with concrete or some strong supporting material. So, we're going to drill a little hole in there, we put the bolt up in there, drill into that concrete, and then we're going to put, put some screws on there and it will stay there. That was the idea. We did have a small risk, however, that actually we don't know where the edge of that concrete fill is. And we thought on one or two of these, we're going to find that actually when we drill that little hole up and we go into the top, we're into yeah, clay, sand, general gunk that's filled up over the years. So we're into the non concrete fill area and we're into something that's not really structural at all and we can't use. So we came up with this detail. We thought, well, that's only going to happen in a few places. Where that is, it, when that is going to happen, what we'll then do, we'll dig down from the top, we'll find the top of that bolt and we'll put a nut on there and we'll have essentially bolts top and bottom. Famous last word. Plan B. A vast majority of those failed to hit concrete. 
So that detail had to be abandoned. So it did work in a few places, it didn't work in a lot of places. And we thought, we don't really want to be trenching out the entirety of the traps on top of this. There's got to be a better option. So working with our wonderful installation contractors who did a good job, they came up with this system. So that you can see there's a screw that they've put in there. They've drilled a hole, they've put a, set, put a, um, a hollow screw thread in there, and then they've screwed a long bolt into that. Again, this is all non-conductive components. They've screwed that in, and then they can mount bolts on the end. That required drilling in, well, all of that required drilling. We came up with a new problem with drilling. Um, how do you drill into a metal bridge step when you're drilling upwards? So you use a magnet. You put a metal bridge step, you use a magnetic drill with a really powerful magnet on, put it onto the bridge, you attach the drill onto the bridge, and then you can use that as a fixed thing and you can drill into the bridge. Except we then found that on the areas we were doing that with the insulated coating applied, the magnet didn't work. The insulated coating we never saw, we didn't foresee, somehow interferes with the magnetic, with the magnetic effect of that drill and it didn't stick to the bridge anymore. So we ended up with a new problem. It was, again, the project we kept on giving. Um, so what we ended up here, they got a hole that they've attached at ground level and they're essentially, they're essentially clamping that onto the underside of the bridge deck and then they can use that metal plate to attach the magnetic drill onto and then they can use that to drill the hole into the bridge deck where they can finally put this system in. No end of problem this project was. More water. So you've got the trough up there. You've now drilled it. You've got drill, you've got drill holes into the bridge. You've got your, your um, you've got your bolts in place. How do you maintain that trough? So you've got a trough that's quite thin, quite narrow, because it can't be too deep, because it's difficult. You're gonna you need to clean it from time to time. So actually, do you start to undo the screws? You take the take it down and you clean it out, or do you jet it out? If you take the screws out, potentially you're now exposing bare metal because you've now opened up, you take the non-conductive non component out, you've now got a path to earth. If those screws fall out under traffic, well, it's a screw. You're not going to do anything. Um, you're, not gonna, <clears throat> you're not going to worry about it. So actually, you're not going to shut the track just because of that. But actually, you then have a path to earth. So again, we had to make sure the screws were very unlikely to come out. We have to work out what happens if they come out, how how is that going to interface with the inflated coating? Um, and we have to make sure that if you do take the screws out, if one snaps or something, and you put one back in, we still have no path to earth. So again, working out exactly the extent of the coating, exactly what materials and how the screw threads were all working was quite a lot of detail. And then we had water dripping through the end of deck connections. Right at the end of the trough, we had water, you can see the troughs here, so water would come along the end there, come round the, around the end, and then drip out here. We caught all the water coming through the weep holes, but then we'd have dripping here as well. And we thought, it's dripping, okay, dripping's probably fine, but actually to what extent does dripping not become fine? So, that, so to get the insulated coating on there, dripping through an insulated coating, again, that potentially provides a path to a, who's to say that's ideal, that's not ideal, what level of water is okay. So actually wherever we had dripping, we went through and put a sealant in and shut the whole thing down. We thought it's best to just get total sealant as much as we can, we're never gonna achieve perfect. But if you get pretty damn close, then it's probably going to be fine, and that's the best we can do. So, moving on to surge arresters. This is a, this de this device here is it looks a bit like an insulator. It's actually a surge arrester. This is the surge arrester fitted at Cardiff intersection bridges on the overly mast. That's just the uh, London Newport side of the bridge. It's got a little Wi-Fi counter on it. Um, that counts how many times the surge arrester is active. There was a big debate about surge arresters. What it does. It takes over voltage from around 200,000 volts down to 70,000 volts. So essentially what it means is that that 270 millimeters that you've got in your electrical standard is allowing for a fault current of up to 2,000, about 200,000 volts. Sorry. And that's partly why the additional space is there. I mean, it still won't arc out even when the wires got their fault, but they're not there most of the time. They're only there when you get faults or lightning strikes or transient, various transients, things like that. So they don't happen very often. Having a surge arrester means that that fault coming along the wire, hypothetically, will come along here. Um, and rather than carrying on along the wire and ending up under the bridge and arcing out on the bridge, what it will do instead is it will come up, it will go to the surge arrester. I'm not showing that very well. Um, sorry, I'll show you on this one. This one is attached down to the contact wire. So the, contact, the electric charge will come up here. It will go through the surge arrester and discharge to earth. 
This is a, a picture of what the surge arrestor looks like. It looks a bit weird. You've got an insulator with a cable around it, but I'll explain what that means. So you're, this is connected to the contact wire. Anything between 200,000 volts and 70,000 volts will discharge through the surge arrestor, through that wire, and discharge to earth. Anything more than 200,000 volts, that's where the surge arrestor potentially stops working. And if the surge arrestor fails, it is likely to fail with a path to earth. So your system cannot be re-energized until you replace the surge arrestor. That's what this is all about, this insulator here. You can then, if that happens, pull the earth connection out. You've then got an insulator between your earth path and your failed surge arrestor. That allows you to reopen the track for that day. And that allows you to get back in that night, that weekend, whenever, it, whenever it's convenient, and replace the surge arrestor and put the system back to operational ability. It should reset. Between those, it should just reset. That's what this counter is all about. And therefore, we've got some data in 10 years time or so. We can come back and say, actually, it's been there 10 years. It's not done anything. We can probably take it out now because it's another component. There was a debate over whether they were needed in the first place. <clears throat> uh, a lot of thought is this is Cardiff. There are a lot of tall buildings around. One of the biggest sources of these things is lightning strikes. If lightning does strike Cardiff, it's going to strike the lightning conductors on the tops of the hotels. It's not going to strike the OLE system here, which is much, much lower down. So that was thought to be very highly improbable, if not impossible. Uh, switching transients, there's no major feeder stations nearby. Um, there's no big neutral sections too nearby. The, the sectioning works that all of those were quite unlikely. So Part of the theory is the surge arrestors probably weren't needed. However, actually saying in a design document, saying how likely is a lightning strike? Well, it probably won't happen, but I can't guarantee it. How likely is a switching transient? Unlikely here because of the setup, but I can't guarantee it. Ditto, ditto, ditto. So we had a design that included them. The safety case that backed up the design included them. The testing we had done for the system, which I'll come on to in a bit, included them. So actually we think they're probably not required. We don't want to go back and undo our design. We can't guarantee they're not required, and so that's why we put the data levels on there. But in 10 years, as I said, we'll come along and probably take the things off. Building tolerances then. Um, what space to allow for a vehicle? So we're now back to, to back to what space we can put under that bridge. We have vehicles going under there. We rather conveniently have a wonderful phrase in the standard, 8573, that's the group standard. It says the maximum height of any vehicle cur currently permitted on the GB railway network, including dynamics, etc., is 3990. Great number, 3990. Fantastic. We can allow for 3990, build a system on top of that, and we know where we are. So the first question is can it be reduced? Actually, can we buy ourselves a bit of space? Because that allows for any vehicle. We don't have every vehicle going on here. We are going to, we are going to have this as a fully normally operational railway. We are going to allow all the trains to go under there, but not that we need to. But actually, we don't necessarily have every train ever allowed along this route. So can we restrict that? And so we started looking at all the individual trains. Some trains are going to be substantially less than that. Some trains are going to be very close, all that value. And therefore, they present different levels of risk. And we built that into our safety case to say, well, actually, some train, yeah, not all trains are going to be at 3990. So whilst we've got some, that's a bit tight, kind of numbers, in our um, final submission, Actually, looking at those, every train that goes under there is probably going to have a bit more. It's probably not as bad as it looks. In, in reality, it isn't as bad as it looks. So the first one was, can we, can we be more specific, which we did? Does it need to be increased? Now, that 3990 is for straight and level track, which obviously we don't have here. So potentially, yes, it does need to be increased because we are on a vertical curve. We do have camps. It is a, a horizontal curve as well. And therefore, we start looking at the standard industry tool, which is clearly. We use clear in a slightly different way though, because we're looking at vertical heights only. For the pure clearance to an electrical wire and how much space do we have to prevent arc to avoid an arc, um, we are only interested in how tall is that vehicle. So we use clear it on a whole array of different vehicles. We put high track fixity on because the first thing we need to eliminate is any other variable. We want just the vehicle. Everything else we have to apply manually and work out exactly what we want is and how we can control it. So we put high track fixity in, that zeroes out any allowance for track fixity itself, we put that in separately. Tolerance is aging or excluded, and obviously we, we worked out only the required vehicles. We got some interesting numbers. Remember that 3990, that is the maximum height of any vehicle permitted on the UK railway network. And these vehicles came out with these numbers. Only a few millimetres, but what's going on here? 
eagle-eyed train geeks among you will notice that they're all electric locos. But what that ended up being, with a bit of digging into the into the theory profiles and seeing what it was actually, those numbers are to the top of the pantograph when it is stowed. So when that train is not actually running on electric power, has the pantograph, the pantograph sticks up to these numbers, and therefore that's your actual size of the train. But here it is an electric line. The whole point of this is that it is an electric line. Therefore, the pantograph's probably going to be up. But without the pantograph, under most operating conditions, these numbers suddenly become these numbers, which are an awful lot more palatable and have a much better clearance to the train, so you can stop worrying about them. It does say, actually, if the pantograph is stowed, so that's being towed, these numbers are still true, and the top part is very much an electrical conductor because it's a carbon strip is the best conductor you can have. So we still need to factor in these numbers, but again, looking at the risks of how frequently that's going to happen, that's actually pretty rare. Then we moved on to the wonderful class 87 loco. 4013, that was a bit of a surprise when that came out, but he's actually the correct value. Um, did a bit of an investigation, rechecked, it is the correct value. There is only one class 87 remaining in operational service. It's up in Scotland. It's owned by a heritage operator and in private ownership, it hardly ever goes anywhere and it's certainly nowhere near Cardiff Inception Bridges. And therefore, a simple solution there was to take it out of the required list. Um, it, it got removed from our list, we discounted it, highlighted very strongly that we had discounted it and we moved on. To the wonderful Class 37, which has been the bane of my life for a long time. This is a lovely picture of the Class 37 slash 4. The 4 subclass is the one with these roof horns. These horns here, which took up an awful lot of my time. It is written into our gauging standards. Um, the class 37 loco, except the one with roof horns, is within loco gauge. It doesn't feature in Clearroot by itself. You can't ask Clearroot to give you a value for the class 37 loco. You can only ask it to give you one for loco gauge, which that's part of, apart from 37.4. And then it says, if, you, yeah, if you're tight, consult the, consult the gauging engineer. So I did. I went and had a chat to my gauging engineer, and he essentially said, I don't know. Um, he went away and asked a few other people, and they said, I don't know. Um, at one stage, I, one of my emails went to every single gauging engineer in the entire uh, entire country that worked for Network Rail, and pretty much all of them came back and said, I don't know. Um, apart from one of them who came back with a wonderful diagram from an old book, which was these lovely static heights. So the static height, not dynamic, static height of the class 37.4 with the roof horns. We finally got these beautiful old pictures, and we now had a value of 3969 millimeters. That's a good start, but that's static, not dynamic. I still had the question of what is the dynamic height of the vehicle. Now, actually, a simple comparison, but I still had to go through various gauging engineers and get WSP to support this as well. What is the static height of loco gauge output by clear route? I can get a number for that on that geometry. The dynamic height is the dynamic loco gauge. So what is the dynamic loco gauge height? Add 6.5 millimeters, static plus 6.5 is that dynamic from clear root plus the same 6.5 should be that dynamic. More or less within a millimeter or so, that's probably accurate. And I got support for that method. It was the only thing I could do. It seemed logical and workable to me, and that's the way we went forward. It does highlight that the 37.4 is an interesting error, um, interesting omission, should I say, in our clearance database. We don't have any way of accurately measuring, actually calculating. The dynamic height of 37.4. That's not a new logo. That's been around for a long time. Interesting things that pop out when you ask every moment. More vertical heights. Kant is beneficial. Now, me as a track engineer, I'm used to working at what we call centre line low rail. We design as a track engineer around the low rail. So whenever Kant is applied, the design always says the low level, low, low rail, and then we apply Kant above that. OLE works the other way around. It took me a long time to get this through my head. Kant is actually beneficial because OLE designed to the high rail, which makes a lot of sense when you're dealing with an electrical conductor because you want the thing that's closest to you. The Kant goes, the Kant takes the track away from the wire. So Kant is actually beneficial. As a track engineer, getting the idea that Kant helped was a bit weird, but I got there. Vertical flow, however, maybe not, because obviously there is vertical flow, it is a, a vertical, there is a vertical curve over the top of the collar. And then of course we moved on to steam locos. Which ones to check? Steam locos are, are authorised whenever they want to run. There is no list in the sectional appendix of which steam locos are authorised on a specific route. 
in general, you've got to allow for them most places most of the time. And when a heritage operator wants to run a steam loco, they ask for approval. The engaging engineer does various checks and usually says, yes, OK. <clears throat> so we needed to know, do the steam locos fit? Steam locos don't necessarily follow the 3990. They're in a slight, slight class of their own. Two popped out on straight and level track. This is 3994 for the class, for the class 7 Britannia. And then 4025 for the King Edward I. That was, a, again, a bit of a surprise. So I can't do that. Um, that's getting a bit much. Actually, we ended up with a, we had to ban the King Edward on one of the four tracks, and the other three we thought it just fits. Um, but if the wire trip, we've got a requ requirement the rating to the stand. If the wire trips out, then you need to go and do an inspection because it's very close, but it does just fit on three out of four tracks. And that opened up another discussion. Well, we've got steam locos. They do come through here on a regular basis. What is the effect of flue gases for reduced clearances and also on the insulated coating? We tried to do a bit of research on that. We tried to work out, well, we talked to GLS. If we have a steam loco underneath it, what happens? How does the How is the coating affected? Is that OK? They couldn't really give us an answer. What we did do is we went on YouTube and we had a quick click through and we found a wonderful picture of a steam train departing the local trip. This is not my video, this is a random video I have found on YouTube. I must credit the person from YouTube for it, whose name I didn't write down, I can't remember. Uh, San, Sans Perel, there we go, I did write it down. Um, but we found this thing and this opened up another discussion. An awful lot of engineering is not necessarily you look in a standard and there's your answer, or you look in a research paper and there's your answer. It's you look for evidence, you look for what happens in some places and you get evidence like that and you think oh what happened there again whether that's true or not whether that's a problem for us or not who knows but it was an interesting conversation so actually again we came up with we don't think a steam loco sitting there passing underneath the bridge is going to have any effect actually the time that those flue gases will be there is not going to be very long there is a small chance that the flue gases are going to a sister an arc forming, but we've got the insulated coating there, so that's unlikely. And if it does form from the contact wire to the steam loco itself, if it will just earth out and the cobby not much will happen. Um, the insulated coating itself, as long as the steam loco doesn't stop, that's a lot of heat and a lot of flue gas. If it stopped under there, yes, we could have a problem, but as long as it's passing through, we thought, well, it's probably not. We haven't got any definitive standard we can point to, but that was the, the engineering decision we had to make. So we've written an operational instruction. Any steam trains going through there must not stop under the bridge. Um, if they do stop under the bridge, we then need to inspect the insulated coating afterwards. So, what's actually needed? We've got lots of interesting numbers now. We've got lots of interesting design. We've managed our water. We've managed we've got our insulated coating on. What value do we actually need? So, we went down to Southampton University. We ran a whole load of tests in our high voltage testing lab. Um, we got some fantastic numbers for this insulated coating. So we needed to understand exactly how good this was. Um, this is called wet testing. So they filled the room. These pictures are from the dry testing because the wet testing, you wouldn't get a picture. They filled the room with as much humidity as they possibly could. So you couldn't really see very much in there. Um, down to 20, we got down to 20 millimeters. We got an arc forming at 20 millimeters. And actually that 20 millimeters gap wasn't really going through the coating. You can see it essentially went along the coating up to the edge where it then earthed out onto the metal around the other side. We, even that was quite impressive. We got down to 20. Um, on, the, on the wet testing for the train, this is an aerial, it's a simulated, well it's not real aerial, it's a simulated aerial. It's a basically a, a metal nail and stuff that sticks up. So that this one was to the bridge and then this one was to the train. So Again, electrical wire to the train, to an area, to a fixed point, so something sticking up, which is more likely on the top of the train, we got down to 70 millimetres before the system earthed out. Now, that was largely due to the result of the surge arresters uh, we, put, we put on, um, because obviously that limits the overall the overall fault currents that were going through there. Um, some impressive pictures. So we've got some good numbers. We've got much less number that we need to apply. We've got much reduced numbers um, that we have built into the track form. We've fixed the bridge. Uh, we still had to scratch our heads and think about what else have we missed? What else do we need to allow for? What do we need to think about? One of them was that the bridge is going to deflect. 
This is a route to a power station. Potentially, in a worst case, you have two fully laden coal trains on top of that bridge at any one time. That's going to cause the bridge to detach down a little bit. You can so you can have a look, you can do whatever survey you want, and you can get the best accurate numbers, but put two trains on top, you've got dynamic effect there. So we had to allow nine millimeters. That was a structural calculation, that wasn't a finger in the wind. It's probably more than will ever actually deflect, and that's the worst case, but we allowed a blanket nine millimeters in the design just to make sure that that effect would never cause us a problem. We looked at the survey accuracy. A standard survey accuracy includes a 10 millimeters allowance for error. Now, again, when we were looking at this, we needed every millimeter, we use a point cloud system. Uh, quite often you would use a simple topographical survey. We use point clouds. That data allowed us to go down to five millimeter accuracy um, and also a six millimeter accuracy on the cant. Purely because, actually again, another five millimeters out of design. There's another five millimeters we can use elsewhere and another five millimeters we know is genuinely space rather than space that may or may not be there due to a survey error. The coating we put on top was five millimeters thick, so actually that brings the essentially that brings the bottom of the bridge down by five millimeters. That eats up another five millimeters of our, um, our clearance. And then the bridge arm itself is 120 millimeters per standard. But my wonderful my wonderful OLE colleague went and actually physically measured one and had, had a real close look at it, and it's actually it's actually 115. 120 is probably just a standard value with a bit of allowance measurement errors and, and insulation errors. But when you accurately measure exactly what you're installing. It's only 115, or we could change type and go down to 109, but I had other implications, so we didn't do that. Other things we need to factor in is TMLA, track maintenance lift allowance. Um, track is not fixed. It's called permanent weight, but it's anything but permanent. Um, over time, as the ballast breaks down, you're going to want to tamp it, and the only way is up. So we have to allow a certain level of additional space there to allow the track to be lifted. We would normally allow 75 or 100 millimetres, depending on the area. Here we got an agreement with maintain that we'd only allow 25 millimetres of truck lift before you have to put the track out and lower it back down again. And then we had, went on to track fixity or track tolerance or track construction and maintenance tolerance. When you start going through the different standards, partly track standards, partly OLE standards, partly various references to other standards, and you start trying to understand exactly where all these tolerances come from, you start finding different terms, what may or may not be the same thing. So we ended up with these, these three distinct terms that all sort of pointed to the same thing. There's TMI on top of that as well. Um, and we spent quite some time scratching out and trying to work out which tolerance in the OLE standard related to the tolerance in the track standard and exactly how the lot works together. We came up with an overall tolerance for that for 18 millimetres, which is a space on top of the 25 millimetres TMLA that we had to allow in the design, for, just to allow the track to essentially breathe and move around. Part of that was also because we are installing a track alignment design, some of the track standards allow that track to be put in 10 millimetres high and declared compliant. So we had to take that out because like, I, can't, I can't allow that. I need to uh, only allow zero height in there and I need to manage the track insulation much more accurately. And so that's where we got to. Does it fit? This is one of the worst case tolerances tables that we ended up with. Um, this is shows you all the different numbers. These numbers are the worst case, 51. So that's 170, sorry, 107, 107 static electrical clearance per socket. So this is upwards, this is electrical system to the bridge socket and passing, so that's when the pantry bar is pushing up on it, 51. So as a pantry bar is passing under that, the worst case, you have 51 millimetres from a live electrical part to the bridge deck. And don't forget, we've got an insulated coating on that bridge deck. That's not going to arc out because there is no path to earth there. So that number of 51 is absolutely fine. And in the worst case, again, to the vehicle gauge, the worst case we've got is 70 millimetres. And that matched our, our lab testing from Southampton University as the worst case. And therefore, again, actually we came out and said, well, in the worst case, with all the allowances, the worst case is going to be 70 millimetres. The lab showing 70 millimetres is acceptable. And we have our design. We have a workable solution through the bridge. That is a picture of what the early system looks like. It has a contact wire cover on it. So from here, you can see it looks like extra, extra, extra thick wire almost. It's a plastic cover that clips over the top of the wire. Um, primarily, that's to prevent birds sitting on it. Um, or if a bird does sit on it, they don't die. We're not bor worried about the birds themselves dying, of course. Um, but what that will happen, if a bird sits on the top of the wire, they will tend to walk underneath the wire and if it rains, get out the rain, and then that creates an electrical path from the wire to the bridge. So one way of preventing that, and again, just avoiding any damage or avoiding any issues, is 
stopping the bird sitting on the wire in the first place, or if they do sit on the wire, they're sitting on a piece of plastic, um, and therefore they're not in contact with the electrified wire. We also put various bird proofing measures under, because the bird spikes and things, just to stop them roosting on the underside to here eventually. Um, plus, obviously, plenty of signage on site to leave it for the future, keep the future maintainers and future operators. That's pretty much the conclusion. So the overall solution, the overall system, um, the, over, the overall conclusion of the system is it's not suitable for everywhere. It is a really good system. It does help bring the comment, bring the clearances that you need down. It does give you the ability to put an electrified system through somewhere which normally you wouldn't be able to fit one. It is ultimately it was a complete pain to do. It was great fun to do. It was a massive learning experience and I loved it. Not every minute of it because there were some very painful times in there, but it was really good fun. Um, it does need careful consideration. It was not an automatic pick this up, use this in, yeah, I've got a bridge that has low electrification. Let's use the system that did in Cardiff. It, it does require a lot of thought. It's not suitable for everywhere, but it could open up better value electrification for some areas where, where it could work. Um, some bridges that, for example, that are currently almost a, there's no solution, there's no option here. It could open up some of those for at least a significant amount of investigation and work out whether it would work or not. And the key thing, obviously, the CSM risk assessment, because you are reducing tolerances that are normally in your electrification standards, you are going past those tolerances. It does need to have a very, very robust risk assessment went along with it. So working with our safety engineers took quite some time as well and getting it all properly signed off at the proper levels. Took quite a while and quite a bit of paperwork. And that, my dear friends, is that. Um, next a few questions. Uh, that was the end of my presentation. Open to open the floor to anyone that wants to buy things at me. Right. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, right. We've had a couple of questions questions in. So Reese Doyle asks, how did the maintainer react to the maintenance limitations and how did you communicate the benefits in terms of whole life cost of accepting this solution? For example, specific tampers being used, which may limit the supply chain. Fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's almost a bat it back at you, Andy, wasn't it? Because you were part of the maintainer that uh, had those discussions with. <laughs> so, yes. Um, it's an interesting one because part of from a track maintenance perspective, um, I was selling, if that's the right word, um, a design solution that was less than ideal and was going to be a bit of a headache um, and was really not, uh, not a great idea. Um, it was almost a case of, well, actually, we're all in a difficult place. We're all in a place where there is no way out of here. We, yeah. The, the slab track system just isn't going to work. We have to stop. We have to do something different. We've got a system that works. I can either choose to sit down with the maintain, maintenance guys and work out the best I possibly can and mitigate what I can and help them through and give them as much information as I can and basically apologise for giving them something that's going to be a pain in the ass for the next God knows how many years. Um, or I can just say, well, that's it, mate. Here you go. So obviously I chose the work who's closely with them. It is not great. Um, whole life is probably not anywhere near where it really ideally should be from a purely track perspective. But when you go to whole life four versus rebuilding the bridge or carrying on with the slab track system, it still pays benefits overall. So you're, you're starting to play off disciplines. The, the track discipline was very much a loser in this case because the track was not very good. Um, the civils was to a certain level the loser because they got, they got a, a bridge with decent coating on it, but actually it made the bridge maintenance slightly harder. And of course, the winner to some extent is the OLE, and the winner is the overall budget cost and the overall cost of the whole project. Um, so yeah, specific tampers. There was a specific tamper used for it. I can't for the life of you tell me which one it was. I know Carillion had a guy whose name escapes me that was absolutely was brilliant. Roger Nicholas, by any chance? It might, might have been actually, yes. Um, yeah, it might, maybe. I, I honestly can't remember. But yeah, they, they, they brought this guy down from somewhere else that just knew so much about tamping. Um, and he, he said, yeah, yeah, I can do this. I can, yeah, I can change this mode and I can put it into this special mode. I can restrict the times and yeah, job done. It was, he, he did a fantastic job. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's essentially what I just pass on. But just to be larger on that a bit, and, and for those of you who didn't see part one of, of, of Phil's talk, when we did the original optioneering on this, in terms of whole life cost, actually reconstructing the bridge came out quite strongly as, as the preferred option. Um, in, uh, 
<laughs> in that you end up with a new, with the new bridge um, um, and the route was prepared to contribute towards the, the cost of the bridge and things like that. The big problem was we couldn't do it within the time scale of the electrification project. That was the biggest handicap um, in that it would have taken some while to design and install a bridge there. And there were few, there was potentially a huge disruption um, to the Valley Line service because it would have all liked to be turned back at Queen Street, which isn't designed for turning trains back. So the next option we came to was re was the track lowering and slab track, but that involved reconstructing the Butte feeder. Um, and in the end, that didn't happen because we ran out of time and we ran out of money. Um, so this is not a great solution from a track point of view. But there again, we have got electric trains to Cardiff, which is the object of the exercise. But I personally can still see us actually doing the slab track and butte dot feeder option at some point in the future. But, uh, anyway, right. Ryan Hancock asked, how did the gauge work for measuring the coating? But I don't think you can answer that one. Can you, Phil, off the top of your head? So. Um, yeah, I, I haven't, I'll be perfectly honest, I have no idea. <laughs> so that's a very simple answer. They, GLS brought that gauge with them. Um, they they showed me it working, they demonstrated it does work, but how exactly it works, I'm afraid I have no idea. Okay, so Rhys Doyle and Paul Ebert asked very similar questions. Um, will the insulation require reapplying? What's the design life of the insulation and will it need regular repair? Okay, okay. Right, so design life, um, depending, it partly depends on what's underneath it. So it depends on the level of paint or protective coating, etc., that went under it and the primers that we used. Um, one of the issues that we had was the existing bridge still had a level of the previous coating, which was obviously getting towards life expiry, um, had been there a while. So we had an interesting decision to make at the start, and this fed into the life of the insulated coating itself. Do we properly blast this bridge? Do we grit blast it right the way back to bare metal? And then we go with the whole DLS system with the, the prior, you know, our own primer. We've got full control of that. Um, that would have required proper encapsulation. That would have made the possessions a lot more difficult. The amount of mess that gets generated when you do a proper grit blast is quite substantial. So obviously that, that makes the project that much more complicated to deal with that. There was a trade-off, so the vapor blast wasn't going to get off everything. Some of the original original coating on there, which couldn't be removed by the vapor blast, would still be there when we put the coating on top. And what that did was it meant that the, the GLS system as applied and the primer underneath it and the protective coating, that the protective abilities that that gives you become slightly diminished. Um, if we had done the grit blast, it would have been a 25 year design life. Um, with the vapor blast and therefore the primer and coatings underneath it, not quite as probably perfect as they could have been, but again, it was a, a whole life project timescale cost to, to do that. It dropped to somewhere in the region of 15 years. Uh, for those 15 or 25 years as it was going to be, no, we don't need to, we don't need to do any works on it. It's literally spray it once you've gone through the initial assessments, not quite walk away. Um, there does need to be a level of inspection just to make sure it's not cracked, bulging, something going wrong with it, but more or less it should sit there for that design life and after 15 years yes you are going to have to reapply it um, at the very least you're going to have to inspect it very very carefully and very heavily but yeah that's that's essentially the design life and that's there was a thought though obviously uh, i'm sorry Andy? well you have to sweep it off to reapply it phil sorry say again you didn't so, do you have to strip it off to reapply it or can you apply additional coat um I think I, I think it was going to be a case to strip it off and do it again, which was going to be a right. time-consuming, difficult operation. Um, but obviously, that's that's the idea behind it. What it does mean, though, um, one of the other factors in here was the bridge itself. We knew was towards the end of its end of its life, um, and at some point in the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years, something along those lines, we were fairly confident that bridge was going to get replaced as a whole. So probably that's the only time we're realistically going to install the coating. At the end of 15 years, it's going to get a really, really good, really detailed inspection, which will hopefully come out actually still in pretty damn good condition. Um, there might be a very small amount of remedial work done at that point, but it's more than likely going to be left as is with a tiny bit of repair. 
it will last until whatever year comes when that bridge is probably finally replaced. That's that's more the intent, more the idea because that, that bridge has got to go at some point soon. Okay, thank you. Right, so Matthew Lupton asked the question, uh, and this is relating to your clearances, I think, with pantographs down, yeah, on electric loco. So if an electric loco is being hauled dead, there is a possible risk of arcing to the pan, he asked, noting the pan horns will be close to the body of the train. Uh, Indeed, yes. So it's going to be quite a rare occasion where we're going to get an electric loco going through. Uh, we did try and establish, is the pantograph, when it is stoned, not, uh, not up, is it actually electrically joined to the train? Is it electrically completely isolated? Um, and what, what exactly would happen with that slightly increased risk? Um, ultimately, it partly comes down to, we don't want to ban the locos for something that's going to happen very rarely. It may or may not arc. It's quite unlikely to arc, but we do have slightly less clearances um, than we, we would normally have. So we have slightly less than 70. But again, even that 70 is, it's not guaranteed to arc. And worst case, if it does arc to the pan, we couldn't get a definitive answer on whether that pantograph was actually electrically floating, i.e. not connected to anything, or whether it was joint connected electrically to the train and therefore they're about. Um, different trains have different setups. We, we didn't know, so we had to take a. Actually, you have to take a slightly different view. So if it does arc to the pantograph and the pantograph is floating, it will either arc to the pantograph. The pantograph will go up and there'll be some system to dissipate that charge, and not much will happen. Or it will arc to the pantograph. It will arc to the train and then earth out, and there'll be a bang and the breakers will go out. And okay, the wire might have a very small amount of damage. Actually, one arc. The so that one passenger train is unlikely to damage the wire, certainly not, not likely to part the wire. It's where you get multiple break, multiple arcings, multiple um, failures in the same place, that the wire over time will degrade and strands will start to pop out or the, the copper will start to melt. One, one single arc, very occasionally, is not likely to be that big a deal. So actually it came back to, we can't answer that definitively. Um, we don't know. We know it's, it's gonna be a rare occasion that we get a dead hauled electric loco, it's going to be an even rare occasion where the numbers all work work against ourselves that actually that's going to cause an arc and even if it does oh well the breakers go out there's a bang a few people nearby go what was that noise um and we have to look at the wire and check it's fine so in reality, could, make could make a bit of a hole in the train though phil it <laughs> it <arcs to> the <laughs> train. <laughs> <laughs> yes it could do um but again it's it, it's one of those there's only so much mitigation you can apply for something that's actually going to be a very rare occasion event. So we, we, we no, have I to appreciate like... that. That's why I said possible risk in the question. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> All right. Um, and then Ryan Hancock asks, is there plans to add the insulated coating to the ranges in the future, such as UKMS? That is a very good question. Um, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I'm searching through the list of names on board and seeing if my if Keith Whiskey, my OLE engineer, is on there. Um, if he, if Keith, you are still on, I can't see you on anymore. He was there earlier, definitely. He was, yeah. I spotted him. I think I think he's I think he's gone, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, on that one again, because I'm the track engineer stroke DPE for this, I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, I would hope so. Um, I'm sure my my uh, my early engineer that worked with me is probably taking that on. Um, I will try and get you an answer if you want. Uh, you want to send me a message to remind me. Um, Drop us an email and we can circulate it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So um, that's the end of the questions that have been po posted. So if, has anybody else got any further questions? All right. If not, I would like to call upon. Philip Gombervan to uh, propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, Andy, um, and, and thank you, Phil. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, <laughs> this this job for 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 you and, and the other guys involved was was an incredible challenge. Um, um, I, I'm sure you, you can look back on it now, as as you've possibly alluded to, and, and think you know that you were quite lucky to get involved with it. It was one of those kind of once in a career, super interesting, incredibly challenging jobs. Very much um, so, yeah. Very much so. <laughs> um, 
some key points for me that uh, that jumped out at me was um, you've left us with 80 millimeters of ballast under those sleepers, you swine. <laughs> um, I apologise to you at the time. <laughs> I still apologise to you now, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I did like your, your 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 slightly different take on on do not tamp signs. So you you giving giving us the option to to look at different ways of maintaining the track going forward, which is uh, which is interesting. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a structural engineer because to me that insulated coating just looks like a, a bit of a nightmare. It's covering up all, hiding all the sins of that pretty old bridge that's not in the graces condition as you've as you showed quite quite um quite well in some of your pictures indeed yeah um, well, we will work to make it better before we put that coating on there's a huge amount yeah. of structural improvement but you, there's only so much i was about to say something a bit rude but there's only so much improvement on something not very nice you can do <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah uh, and and who'd have thought that uh, the the roof horns in a class 37 would cause so many so many issues as well <laughs> Um, so uh, overall, Phil, I, I think um, your, your the talk this time, and unfortunately I missed the first part, so hopefully I'll catch up on that when it's posted up on here sometime. But I think it, it just proves how passionate you are about your job and this this particular project in particular, in, uh, specifically. You know, um, and I can only say thank you for, on behalf of everybody for taking the time to uh, to present this to us this evening. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you. Oh, I've enjoyed doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Ooh. Right. I've noticed so. that, I don't know if you're saying it, Andy. Um, Ian Edwards, who was also one of the early engineers, um, has popped back up and has, has might be able to answer the question about UKMS. He disappeared briefly, but he's rejoined. Um, if right. I could have right. a delayed question and allow Ian Edwards to answer the, answer the question there. Um, Ian, Ian, if you're on, if you can unmute yourself. Um, there was a question directly. Is, is there plans to add the insulation coating to ranges in the future, such as UKMS? Um, I answer? don't know about GLS coatings, if you can't hear me, because they were very reluctant to allow their findings of testing to be published to the whole of the industry. GLS, uh, yeah, the insulated coating itself was found out through uh, trial and error, and somebody in the, the low voltage sector managed to find out that their coatings was a, a good insulator. So when they actually tested it, they tested a couple of millimeters and realized it could withstand many thousands of volts, which took GLS by storm because it was chiching. It was, their eyes lit up and thought, hang on, where, where else can we use this? I'm not aware of it going into UK Master Series. The drawings for all the surge arresters definitely did go into the Series 1 element. I think um, some of the drawings were provided through our designers via me into the uh, the, the Series 1 guys who sat in Swindon and read in. So they, they have put all the drawings into the Series 1 group. But as part of GLS, I don't yet know whether or not GLS were willing to put the product into the, the ballpark of HV insulation. Now knowing what it has done and what it can do, then maybe they'd be more willing to do so. Thank you very much for that clarification, Ian. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Right. Okay. So, if there's no more questions, I'd like to draw the meeting to the close. So, just before we, we finish, is there any any queries on the notes of the last meeting? No. Right. So, future meetings. So, we've now got our um, program sorted out till April. So, in December the 14th, we've got Tim Kendall um, coming to talk about tram train. On the 11th of January, we've got Kevin Hope coming to talk about train track recording. On the 8th of February, Alex Hinchelwood will be coming to talk about what well, is given the talk called Con We Do It Again about the remedial works on the festival front. Um, on the 8th of March, um, we've got Jeremy Reese um, coming to talk or, about um, the permanent way on the Isle of Man. And then in the 12th of April, we've got Mark Howell talking about the drainage works that were carried out at Cowley Bridge Junction X as part of the flood defences to make sure that the uh, the main line um, to Exeter can be reopened quickly in the event of flooding. So, 
Um, if there's no further business, then I will call the meeting to a close. Thank you very much for your attendance tonight and wish you all the best. Cheers. Thank you.